everyone and welcome to the new episode of Full Final Life. We are back after three weeks of pause caused by our workshops in London and Amsterdam. And today we would love to cover the topic that kind of came as a consequence out of our workshops, right? Because we hosted workshops around planning pilot cluster-based uh, ABM programs. And a lot of folks uh, came after the workshops to us and asked, okay, but how can we normally plan and structure long-term initiatives, right? Not just only account-based marketing, but let's say demand generation, awareness, and other activities. How do you plan these programs? How do you present them to executives, to sales, right? And how you are getting buy-in from them. So this is what we are going to discuss today. We would love to structure today's episodes. Um, I want to split it into two kind of phases where we are going, first of all, to talk about the planning guidelines and principles and show a few examples to to, to give you a sense of how to tackle certain or particular parts of the planning process and then uh, explain the buy-in process, right? What would be the right way to present it to, to your senior leadership and uh, how can you uh, navigate their concerns and address the critical questions? Um, we're again broadcasting from our offices in southern Spain. Let us know in the chat, guys, where you all joining us from. Uh, curious to hear. Hello, everybody from Valencia. I'm really excited to dive into this topic. Next week, we are also going to run a webinar where we are really going to share the framework about how to plan an ABM program for next year. And if that is something that you're planning to do, we can share with you how to actually go through the whole planning process is only two weeks. It's a framework that we have refined through these workshops. I think like five different workshops that we ran this uh, this year and, and every time we updated our framework. So it's kind of a polished and ready to share with, with our community. Hey, everybody. Yeah, we have people from three different continents here, India, South Africa, Buenos Aires, Argentina. So again, happy to see our international community. That being said, I feel we can dive in. And as I mentioned, uh, we would love to start with the planning guidelines, right? Again, keep in mind that we are talking about long-term programs. We are not talking about one-off campaigns or let's say short time frame campaigns. This is the, the strategic initiatives that you want to turn into motions that you want to run in your organizations. So uh, let's start with the first one. And it's all about planning and sprints. I will pass my microphone to Vlad because I think that we have a few complimentary slides just to show you practically what do we mean by planning and sprints. Absolutely. Can you help me out with sharing? Yes. Thank you yeah. very much. So we have prepared a bit of collateral as usual for our live audience so that we can share and those who will be watching us on YouTube and not listening to share some examples, uh, frameworks, etc. And the first planning guideline is to start planning in sprints with milestones um and a scoped sprints with clear milestones with clear goals that will allow you to deliver a meaningful to create to, to make meaningful pro progress and deliver a meaningful uh implementation in anywhere between uh one to three months uh we do have usual length of our sprints is about one month when we do it together with the clients, but uh, we also have always planning for the quarter, right? So we always look at, okay, how can we actually break it down uh, so that we have a meaningful progress in a short time? Why? There's different reasons. First, having a shorter timeline where you already have deliverables forces you to think about potentially like leading indicators or um, early metrics that you want to see change and talk about it with people 
before you start a program so that you are actually managing expectations in the right way because even though we are running a long-term program the reality is that a lot of executives a lot of salespeople might get impatient might simply forget about what you have discussed last let's say october let's say we are now in somewhere in may and uh, we, the last time we have given that presentation was maybe uh, November this year. And it's like they will have forgotten uh, your agreements. They will have forgotten your presentation. So they will want to see faster progress and you want to uh, be able to do it. So when you do it in sprints, obviously like upfront agreeing on realistic metrics that you can see change during one sprint, then you can also uh, do a more frequent reporting. Now, at the same time, I think this is also really helpful for the team because the team progress begets progress. So when you can deliver something meaningful in a short time, you get that feeling of progress, team becomes more motivated and you create the momentum actually in your team. Um, whenever Andre and myself, and this is just the, the reality of the business, you're not always able to follow all the best practices and you know, getting overwhelmed with a lot of projects, with a lot of work. Sometimes we actually don't follow this principle. And whenever we do follow, we see that our productivity is almost double. And it's just a fact. Whenever we planning sprints, delivering sprints, we do more, we are more motivated, we get better results. So when I say sprint, what is it again? It is, for example, if you're just starting with a program like in this uh, specific case that we are sharing here, uh, the, the sprint goal is setting the ABM fundamental processes. Of course, uh, you know, other sprints may have other goals as you're building out your program or refining your program. So, for example, the first one may be about setting up fundamental processes. The second one may be about starting with uh, getting some account engagement, starting some conversations. The next one might be about turning those conversations into discovery calls. Uh, the next one might be about creating buyer enablement for, let's say, um, accounts that are currently in the pipeline or you had a, a discovery calls with, et cetera, et cetera. So it's always like very focused on a specific goal. It has targets. So targets, again, We'll dive deeper into the leading indicators, but basically um, at the beginning, the targets may be something like, mm, in this case, activities, right? So, so these are the things that you can control. So we want to create this many pieces of, let's say, LinkedIn content. We want to set up this webinar. We want to invite this many people. We want to have a webinar with a number of participants, et cetera, et cetera. So things that in principle you're able to control and also leading indicators in the sense of having the early traction at the beginning it might be just engagement then conversations then discovery calls later on opportunities pipeline sales etc cetera, etc cetera, right so um you want to have clear targets and really important is to have a clear timeline so you want to you're usually working in some sort of a team if you're running a full funnel a bit of a marketing program or an ABM program, you're probably also working in a cross-functional team. So it is even more important to have exactly what are the responsibilities of different people, who needs to do what, when, uh, because obviously there are dependencies and it's important for you to work like that. And one final remark about the sprints is for you to be able to maintain the sprints, what you should be able to do as well is for C, weekly, we like to use weekly pipeline review meetings where you can review the progress, where you can share uh, the insights that you're getting from the market, where you can also plan the next activities if you have some accounts, engaged accounts, et cetera. Again, we have addressed this in other episodes, but having this regular meetings really helps maintain the sprint and obviously as well, as you're finished one sprint, having a quick retrospect of the sprint, uh, understanding what were the results, 
what the, the things went well, what are the learnings that we should take to the next sprint, and of course, agreeing uh, and kicking off the next sprint. So that's all I wanted to say about sprints. If you don't have anything, Andre, take it away or address the next point. Yeah, I just wanted to add a few more points here, basically summarize on what you have said. I think the best, um, the best outcome of planning and sprints is that you have a long-term program that you know is really important for your organization, but you can't forecast it. You can't justify ROI. You can't prove the value of that program. And that there is a significant delay between the activities that you are doing now and the revenue outcomes, right? So when you split it into these small sprints and Vlad gave a nice overview of how the sprints could be structured, right? Then you can adjust team's capacity. You can adjust every sprint to the strategic initiative of your teams, right? And then you can show something. The ultimate goal of the sprint to show something that works, right? Some processes and sprints help with this instead of having, you know, like a broad picture, like especially we love kidding when, you know, marketers talk about awareness campaigns and they say, hey, you need just to post valuable content and then the leads will come. But when? Well, it depends. So just make sure that you are following the best practices and do, you do it for, for a long time. So uh that being said uh let's move to the second part and it's all about the team's capacity and ownership i feel that a lot of programs are being shut down or failing just because there are no there is no clear ownership of specific processes and specific metrics from your team and because in most cases you have um you have cross-functional collaboration. You involve content, you involve dimension team, you involve performance marketing, you might involve business development reps, you might involve account executives, you might involve product marketing, subject matter expert, right? Uh, at different periods of time, they might have different capacities. So for you, that would be essential that when you involve them, who will be on what? And then there should be a really uh, there should be a signed agreement between teams okay this is the person who is in charge of this right making sure that if let's say you assign content marketer to create like eight pieces of account specific content that this person owns that process and will be uh, kind of accountable for the outcomes that would be really important the second one is just making sure that you adjust uh, the out or the targets for that sprint with the capacity of your team. And I will show you the example how we normally do this. So if we we'll look at um, this slide, you can see that for every sprint, we kind of put, uh, for example, we know for that month, we have 75% of availability of ABM lead and we have 75% of availability of demand generation manager. But the, for the month number two, right, uh, we might not have this availability. So then you readjust your processes and just restructure the uh, outcomes of that sprint. So that, that would be really essential. Don't just plan, you know, through the pink colored glasses, right? You just need to accept the reality of how people call it, embrace the reality, right? And adjust the, uh, the program, the activities that you're going to do and the targets or leading indicators to the capacity of your team. But make sure that there is clear responsibility list, list of responsibilities and the, uh, the ownership of certain metrics. So uh, I feel there is a really good question which we can pick up. Let, uh, let me Absolutely. show it on, on the screen, so feel free to... Thank you. So Bruce asked about events because that was just something that was uh, in the example. And he asked, when you to re refer events in this sprint, that was the example, do you refer to virtual events or in-person events? What's the most recommended format for enterprise target accounts and large buying committees? And I kind of started answering that in, in the chat, but for everybody listening, I think it makes sense to address it. I, it will depend on the goal. So let's say that you want to generate awareness. You will have, a you might use different 
formats versus, for example, accelerating pipeline versus expansion, et cetera, et cetera. And so, for example, uh, if it, the goal is awareness, it might be uh, an online webinar. It might even be like an online summit, like the one that we run every, every year. It could be, for example, a local event. For example, if you have um, concentration of your target accounts in specific cities, maybe you collaborate with a local influencer in that city and organize an event there and invite those target accounts. Or maybe you have a customer in that city and then you invite them in their office and you co-host the event. And it's actually even easier to then invite other target accounts on behalf of your customer, right? Gives a lot of credibility. Um, it could be a round table discussion. I know, for example, when you have expert guests who really are interested in discussions with their peers. I know, for example, some market marketers ran really successful round table events, for example, for CISOs and security uh, managers and directors of information security. It could be, for example, maybe you have like a big event on a trade show where a lot of your people, a lot of the buyers from the industry are coming. You can organize an event there, maybe an executive dinner, maybe you invite one of the speakers there to do a private event for the target accounts uh, that are attending that event, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If your goal is, for example, to run a, let's say, pipeline acceleration, and you identify that in your pipeline, you have a number of accounts that have similar challenges. You might, for example, co-host a webinar or an event with one of the existing customers uh, who had a similar challenge for whom you have solved that challenge and run it. If it is for expansion, you may run an internal event. That is to say, only invite people from that target account where you want to run the expansion play and actually co-host it with the champion. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There are many different flavors and many different ways uh, to run events, and I think it's interesting to mention in the context of planning long long term programs, um, having an event as one of the milestones. Um, let's say every quarter, for example, or or at a certain point as you're rolling out your program, is usually. Uh, a very good milestone to work towards because a lot of the other activities can kind of culminate on that event and you can and events also provide the very like five six different possible possible touch points for anybody who is uh, invited attending etc that event and I think again about creating the momentum, seeing some results, events can actually help you generate those results if you have done the previous steps well. So uh, it actually makes sense to consider them definitely part of the program. And one thing that I would advise when it comes to events is to just sit together with the, the, the whomever is internally responsible for those events. Make sure that you have the calendar of all the events that you're already planning and see how you can integrate and how you can leverage those events for the program that you're planning right now, a program, uh, your colleagues may be planning some events, there may be some events on your calendar, make sure to see how can we integrate our program, how can you leverage those events and basically get a one plus one is three, us benefiting from our program perspective and those events actually getting better results. Hope that answers your question, Bruce. And I also, I see a few more questions uh, regarding the events, which kind of led me to an idea uh, that I want to validate with you guys. Would you like us to host another episode just focusing on the event, events themselves through the planning perspective, types of the events, uh, events that could be added to account-based marketing program, also answering these questions about RI? Let me know, please type plus or interested or yes, whatever you prefer in the chat. So just curious to see if, if you'd like us to host that uh, episode and we can do it um, in two weeks. Uh, and while you're typing, uh, let me quickly share this question that is coming from Kumar. Proven ROI of large events is a huge challenge. And I will uh, address this question in a simple way. Before starting the um, large events, 
you need to nail down the small events. So you need to make sure that you can present the ROI of your small events, right? And these events purely depend on the goals. That could be, uh, you know, like Vlad said, this could be uh, account specific events. So where you invite, you know, your client and few accounts. This could be events for your customers. That could be, this could be events for your prospects. You, it depends, but always start with small scoped events and also the events that won't cost a lot. So before, you know, planning huge events where you need to invest money, make sure that you try this virtual event first, right? And see how it works. So first of all, you can nail down the processes because uh, then it would be way easier to leverage these best best practices and to run bigger events in future. But coming back uh, to our topic and long-term planning, right? Like Vlad said, it abs it's absolutely important to make sure that these events are not coming out of you know random acts of uh, are not coming as random acts of marketing oh we want to do an event next quarter no this should be well planned so this should be a part of your annual strategy right so you need to embed them and then you need to because it, to make sure that that would be ROI and that your event will work properly you need to allocate the team you need to set up these responsibilities this is what I am sharing and then the event itself it could be a mini sprint because that would be uh, several activities that you need to do setting up the event event promotion event promotion itself would be a mini sprint where you involve everybody and you make sure that uh, depending on the goals everybody who is involved in the event promotion do their best to hit the let's say sign up targets right then the event itself and then there would be post event playbook because you are doing events for certain reasons right either to grow the business with existing clients or generate new pipeline and you need to develop this meaningful playbooks and this uh, all could be the sprints themselves and also i see yeah so there is uh, the, there are quite a lot of questions so uh, about the events so um i said yeah, that. people so, i think people are also mentioning that they would like us to uh, have a, a separate episode with that so i think Perfect. Without derailing too much from the topic of today, I think this would be the best uh, solution to organize that as a separate po podcast, if you agree, Andre. Yeah, absolutely. So next week we'll uh, host a webinar. I dropped the link. It's all about planning account-based marketing, which could be complementary to what we are talking today, right? So you'll see the guidelines that we use. And uh, then a week after we can host this episode. Now, uh, one thing that I would love to mention regarding the events, one of the most important things here also in terms of justifying ROI, you need to make sure that people are actually signing up for these events. So during the last few months, we uh, experimented with Vlad with a tool that is called Mouse Flow. And this is a fantastic tool that actually analyzes the engagement with your sign up form. So you can say, okay, if people uh, like, if people land on your sign up page right are they willing to sign up certain let's say certain uh fields or they are going to skip so you can see you can literally define the fields that create the churn right so the fields that people don't want to fill in and i think this is really important because quite often that could be you know there could be a request coming from sales hey please make sure that there is this field asking this specific question i we want to know this about we want to get this information about our signups right and you as a marketer you just add this field asking these questions but you have no clue if it has impact on sign up rates or not so this tool actually helps you to analyze this information and see how your web forms are performing. So uh, we highly recommend you to try it. And why we love it? Because you can always start with free trial and evaluate if it's a good fit. So uh, we'll share the link in the, uh, in the chat and also in the podcast description so you can uh, start with the free trial. That being said, let's <laughs> wrap up the events and let's come back to the guideline, uh, to the planning guidelines. All right. So I think the next topic is about leading indicators. And I'm just trying to share the screen. I 
I'm here. Okay, perfect. So let me share the screen um, with what we have prepared, a collateral for this. I actually wanted to share with you a very kind of a integrated view uh, where we share, where I hear what you can see on the screen for those that are listening is an overview of one sprint, a plan for one sprint. And the bottom, there is actually different uh, in leading indicators, milestones and leading indicators, right? So I wanted to share that as an example. I think it's going to be helpful to see the bigger picture, right? So let's dive into that. Okay. Okay. This is perfect now. So again, depending on where you are in the process of implementing your long term program, this is an example of an early sprint. It's, I think, even like the first sprint. Uh, in this case, it is a six week sprint where we are actually focused really on implementing the ABM foundations and starting with the target buyer engagement or buyer, uh, engaging buyers from the target accounts. And the kind of leading indicators here that you have, what you see at the bottom are two rows. The first one is activities. So we always track or always want to have uh, both in terms of targets and in terms of tracking um, as, as also leading indicators, because this is something that is completely in your control, are the key activities or the key output from your team, okay? So for example, if I'm running ABM and I am not able to, for example, source enough accounts for my program, source, research, and engage an X number of accounts, 10 accounts or whatever, five per week, whatever my capacity is, I can't hope to be able to generate opportunities with, let's say, 10 accounts if I'm not even able to source them, right? So you get how it is important to do activities that will eventually lead to results. So we list activities in this case, account sourcing in and prioritization, pipeline review and reporting. We list also outputs um, for, from the content team, three original LinkedIn posts about the ICP challenges each week. And in addition, two posts that are based on repurposing or roundup, and in this case, we have a, as a target also to have the webinar content prepared. And then uh, for the sales development, we have kind of broken this down in, by three roles, ABM management, content, and sales development. For sales development, we had specific targets for daily social engagement, network building, restarting conversation, et cetera. So these are the these are the targets that are related to the activities because we know this is something that we can control. And if these activities don't happen, you can't expect to actually get any significant results. At the same time, we also want to share the leading metrics that our management actually cares about, right? Again, we all know that they all really all, not only care about, they care about revenue, right? In, in one way or another. Uh, revenue growth, you know, closing deals, generating and closing deals. But an early indicator that they will understand is account engagement and, for example, conversations with the target account. So in this case, our target is that after implementing that first sprint, where there's also a lot of learning, where there's also a lot of setup, uh, foundational work, we do want to see about 15 accounts engaged and it's very important that when you create a metric like for example account engagement to be very precise about what does that mean and so the way that we have defined it in this case is high intent visits to the website multiple engagement with relevant icp content so let's say not uh, content with a selfie but content that is actually uh, about their challenges and our solutions and for example, a webinar sign up or a webinar att attendance. So this is something that we consider to be an account engagement. And this is how we uh, track that. And then another key indicator that they will definitely understand and, and, and value is 
how many accounts, how many conversations were we able to start, or more precisely, how many accounts can we did we start to start uh, manage to start conversations with? So in this case, we aim to after this initial sprint to have five or more accounts with conversations. And again, we define this very precisely. For example, having a relevant email or LinkedIn chat, a two-way chat about their projects, priorities, challenges, etc. So again, not chatting about the weather, but actually having relevant conversations that they respond to. <laughs> so it's like a two-way conversation. So it's very precisely defined. So these are examples of leading indicators uh, again, to summarize, activity-based, things that you can perfectly control, and um, also outcome-based, uh, but or, or especially early on without yet being able to have, let's say, sales-qualified opportunities and sales within the first six weeks of the program, what are the kind of outcomes that you can look at? Well, for example, the two examples that I shared were account engagement, conversations. In the next sprint, maybe could be also, for example, discovery calls. This is another leading indicator that most teams, most sales teams and most executives will accept as a leading indicator, although it's not necessarily at the sales qualified opportunity pipeline or revenue. Hopefully that gives you an overview of how we think about leading indicators in our program. And they're really important as a part of your long-term program because it's long-term, you don't see immediately the result. So uh, how do you actually show the progress, keep everybody in the team excited about the progress, but also keep the management uh, relaxed that you're going in the right direction. Yeah, and if you don't mind, can you please allow me the screen share and I will show you guys the next point which we consider essential for when planning the long-term programs. You need to embed these leading indicators into your reporting. Something that is visible to everybody, something that is easy to understand, right? And also something that accumulates the metrics while running this program. So you can divide this like your long-term initiative into short sprints, but it's absolutely important to show how the metrics are progressing over time. This is like, because people, I mean, they have short time view and also everybody can speak from hindsight, right? It's easy to say, oh, okay, like this is big, like we, we completely forget where we were three months ago or six months ago. Now we have these targets or sort of this metrics, let's set up these targets. It's absolutely important to show where did you start and how did you progress? It also helps your team to be on the same page. So let me show you an example of the report that you can potentially use, right? So you embed uh, your, you create your leading indicators first. And again, as we kind of mentioned, you need to define where this metric comes from. So like, how are you going to measure this? who is an owner of this specific metric, then the sprint target and the current status, right? This is really essential. And also then the lagging indicators. And lagging indicators are the outcomes of your activities, right? Discovery calls booked. They are not coming out of nowhere. And I know that a lot of teams, they want to always focus everybody on the lagging indicators, right? But just to make sure that you achieve lagging indicators, you need to define right leading indicators. You need to incentivize your team to do the right activities that will help them to to move the needle and achieve these activities. So this is this is the like a simple dashboard, right? Obviously you don't have the full context. Why do we set up these certain indicators? But this pretty much gives you an, an idea, right? You have the metrics, you have the lagging indicators, you define all together how you're going to measure it. You have the sprint targets, you have current status, and then you have metrics that you put every week here, right? That's why it's essential, like Vlad said in the beginning, it's essential to have this weekly pipeline review meetings. Because if your metrics are not moving forward, if your metrics are not improving, it means that something, 
that that you are doing something that is not working, right? Something that you need to kind of readjust as the team. So that's that's really essential. That helps you to keep everybody on the same page, but also not lose the sight on the most critical metric. I uh, saw this question coming from Nikolai when he signed up for this episode. What is the number one metric that marketing and sales should track? And it's really simple. It's pipeline and revenue. So that actually two metrics, right? The two core metrics that both marketing and sales need to track. So always make sure that your leading indicators are connected to pipeline and revenue, right? That would be the key. And the last principle would be uh, basically uh, setting up. You can use this. Uh, you can again. You can use this report. Uh, in spreadsheet, if you don't, if you prefer to set up um, report in your CRM, that's also fine. Just make sure that uh, you uh, can uh, you can involve your revenue operations manager to populate the right dashboards. Uh, if you run programs like account-based marketing tools like HubSpot or Salesforce, are honestly not adapted to to to, to show the right uh, reports and also demonstrate leading indicators. So you might consider solutions like Hockey Stack, for example, that give you much better uh, overview of, of your program. So that's 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 the key. So make sure that the final dashboard, but the key is that the, the final dashboard is easily accessible by everybody and uh, all the metrics are pretty understandable. So we finished the first part. The second part would be all about how should we present our program to our key stakeholders, to senior leadership and to sales to get the buy-in. I think it will help a lot if you can just uh, go through the, uh, let's say, principles that you need to apply to your presentation, right? When you are going to share it with the executives and then I can show one example that people can use. All right. So I think what, are the principles to create a presentation. I think even before creating a presentation, something, I mean, to give you a bit of context, um, getting this buy-in from the executives, from the sales teams uh, and everybody who is involved, it is kind of our core business. And the reason that I say this is that, of course, if you are selling consulting services uh, for ABM implementation, ABM strategy and ABM implementation, for us, getting the buy-in is the difference between having a deal that is going to, uh, with you know, several several months or or, or years, or having uh, a one-off engagement with a client. So this is something that we have done many many times, and some of the principles that uh, I see are really important is first of all, is you really need to talk to the key stakeholders and really understand their goals and challenges, their own team's priorities and challenges. Obviously, also, that will include whomever is representing the business. So whether that is your CRO, uh, whether that is another executive, uh, maybe you don't necessarily have to talk to them, but maybe they will have presented this uh, during an all-hands meeting or otherwise. But really, really important to anchor everything in the business goals, right? Next is uh, understanding the key stakeholders. Who are the key stakeholders that will be involved in the decision making of or approval basically of your program, right? And that is usually sales, somebody from sales, sales leadership that might be, again, maybe an executive that might be, you know, uh, somebody from the marketing team, your CMO or otherwise. So, Knowing their goals as well is really important, their pro, uh, their priorities, their goals, but also their challenges will really help you. Because let me, let me give you an example. If I go now and I want to present to a sales leader, we are going to run awareness pro, brand awareness program. And what is a brand awareness program? Brand awareness program is where we are going to make a lot of a lot of uh, people in the market aware of our brand identity values and, and whatnot, right? Well, prob the, the chances are very high that they might not be very excited about your program. However, 
let's say, and this is a real example, let's say I sit down and I talk to the EMEA director and sales director and I talk to them and they share with and I ask them like what are the top challenges that you have and they they share that okay in our key markets let's say the UK and the Nordics we don't really have good brand awareness with our target accounts and we lose on brand what does that mean that our prospects choose a safer option a brand that is very well known in the local market it means that their salespeople, when they're doing outreach, don't get through, don't cut through the noise. Doesn't matter how well they actually personalize their outreach, they don't cut through the noise uh, because buyers receive so much email that they ignore everything unless they know the person or know the brand. So now we are starting to talk in the terms that sales will understand. So even if I want to present some awareness programs, I want to make sure that I link that to that specific challenge that sales has. Okay, with this program, what we are going to do, we are not going, going to drive general brand awareness. We are going to align with you on your target accounts, on the high priority accounts, whether those are in pipeline or net new accounts, and we are going to help you create the awareness in the buying committee. And when we say awareness, we mean very specific things, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the first principle. So the, the next principle is once you understand the goals and challenges, you're actually presenting your program as a solution that will help you achieve those goals. And you need to also address those challenges, right? So the first thing that you want to share is, okay, why am I suggesting this program? And why am I suggesting this program now? That could be linked to the described challenges. Again, let's say we have lack of awareness in the target accounts in the UK, Nordics, whatever, high priority accounts. So let's say I'm running a program uh, that will help us create awareness using LinkedIn. So let's say some sort of LinkedIn thought leadership slash expertise content program. Uh, together with sales, this is something that I want to present to them. Well, why? Because this is your biggest challenge. We are now have very low response rate. We are losing on, on brand. We don't have that brand awareness in the target account. So we are going to use LinkedIn. Why LinkedIn? Because we know that these accounts are on LinkedIn. We have seen that uh, they are following this and this and these people on LinkedIn, engaging with, let's say, these thought leaders. And so part of our program, for example, is going to be uh, uh, distributing content to those buyers, but also maybe uh, working together with those thought leaders that our buyers are following. So why do we believe it will work? In other words, is because we know that they are active on LinkedIn. We know that we had some opportunities come through there, but we are not leveraging the channel as much as possible. And uh, we are going to use LinkedIn to help you solve these challenges to one, increase the awareness and to help the salespeople increase their response rate because we are going to, for example, um, help them be perceived as more as an expert or a trusted advisor, advisor rather than yet another rep you know, knocking on your door, trying to sell you something, right? So the next thing that you want to, uh, the next things really that you want to present uh, in, in terms of the principle are actually linked to everything that we have shared so far. Like we want to be able to present very clear goals and expectations, including both the early signals, like the milestones in other, what can we expect after running this program for you know month three months six months nine 12 months right so this is what we mean by expectations right next you want to also help connect the dots what do i mean by that i mean that you want executives sales people they care about results they care about revenue they care about creating deals with target accounts. So you need to show them the quote unquote, the framework, connect the dots between the activities that you plan to do and how these will eventually lead to 
account engagement, account conversations with buyers, discovery calls, uh, sales qualified opportunities and deals. Uh, we like to use visual frameworks. They are helpful because on, in, in one view, you can see how these different activities connect. Uh, I think Andre will share an example. The next one is what we have been discussing today. You need a clear plan and milestones. You need to show that you know what you're doing, that you have a plan, that you know what you need from the rest of the team. You need to, you need to show that you know um, who will do what by when, et cetera. So having a clear program, showing the milestones is important. And then obviously I already mentioned that really a clear ask in terms of the team and the budget. So when, it, when we talk about the team, so let's say if you're rolling out a new long-term program, usually we will start with the pilot. So you want to lower the ask. So you're not asking, I don't know, X amount of people to be involved, but maybe just a minimal one person from sales, maybe one person from your marketing team, maybe one person from the content team to help you with this program. And then also like having very clear idea about, okay, these are the activities that we expect them to, to, to work on. This is the capacity that we will need from these people. So what are the, in other words, like how does your team look like and what are the, what is the ask? How much of their time do you need? And finally, also obviously the budget. So what is the budget that you need? And obviously if you're presenting the budget, you, the best way to present the budget is also to present the expected impact. And the way that you can present the expected impact is the kind of the before and after or without and with, right? So without this program, we know we have this challenge. We have the low response rate. We have this kind of win rate. We have this kind of pipeline. We expect with this program to improve by X, Y, and Z. Maybe we have some proof points from the past that if, because we have run some experiments, if we don't, uh, then the, the next best thing is to use some sort of a case study of a similar company. For example, uh, if, if you have some data that you can show, okay, similar situation, similar company, uh, these were the impacts of the program. So to summarize, you need to link it to the goals of the business and of the key stakeholders that you're presented, presenting, understanding their priorities, challenges, show your program as a solution, to achieve those goals and uh, some of those goals or impact those goals and solve uh, some of these challenges. Show a visual framework connecting the dots, have a good plan, show that you know what you're doing, who do you need from the team, what is the allocation that you actually need and the budget, uh, of course, linked to the expected impact of that program. I also forgot to mention that um, in a, few weeks, probably in three weeks, we are going to host a live uh, bootcamp with Vladimir. So we'll have four live um, workshops. That would be obviously a virtual one based on these live workshops that we hosted in Amsterdam and Antwerp in London and Copenhagen and Vilnius. So we had fantastic engagement and a lot of people asked if we can host this virtual. So if you guys mm -hmm. would be interested, I will drop a link in the chat so you can uh, sign up for that bootcamp. Now, uh, I would love to show you a visual example of the presentation that you can show your team, right? So your key stakeholders. Uh, this is the, let's say, example deck that you can use. And it shouldn't be really long. It's kind of following up the steps that Vlad mentioned, right? So answering the question, why this program? Because your program would be always competing against other priorities and ideas that you have across your organization, the goals that we want to achieve, right? Then this visual framework, you basically, it shouldn't be super complicated, but you can just, maybe I will put it on the full screen so you can see, you just explain how the dots are connected. These are the certain activities that we are going to do to create awareness, right? Then we are going to send these messages that they will help us to build a relationship or do the account research and understand their needs. And these are the activities that we are going to do to book 
calls and generate sales opportunities, right? Nice and complicated, just show them the kind of the key steps and uh, comments them. Then the program plan and milestones. This is would be the most important thing. So everybody wants to see that you actually have a plan. I bet that in most organizations, nobody will be diving into details, but just to make sure that you have the plan, the clear timeline and clear deliveries, right? These milestones will help to get by in and support. The worst thing is to come and say, hey, we want to do dimension, but what are you going to do? Yeah, for the next three months, we'll be posting content, doing some podcasts, maybe running a few webinars, and that's it, right? So this is not how it's going to work. Nobody will buy in for this. But when you'll show that there is a clear plan with milestones, then people will uh, kind of support that idea. The detailed plan you need to leave for the team that would be executing on it so everybody could understand their roles and responsibilities. And sometimes you can include the ICP if that makes sense in your case, then the leading indicators and expectations, pilot team involvement and responsibility, and the budget, right? What you want to do and what you can expect. In some cases, you can also add even frequently asked questions, right? Why we are doing the things. But uh, one more thing that I would love to share with you is the question that um, Silvano asked us, how can we tackle the alignment, alignment challenges that happen between marketing and sales if uh, located in a certain region, let's say EMEA and headquarter has different priorities or different view of the strategy and activities that we should do. So literally you can take the same approach, but one of the most important things would be figuring out in your organization, one sales rep, it could be business development rep, it could be account executive, it could be even sales leader, but this person should be a friendly person to marketing, right? Something who is willing to collaborate. I think this is one of the most critical things. Next step is, uh, I will just uh, change uh, the document that I'm sharing. The next step is literally creating an internal business case why we are going to do the certain things, right? And here is an example that's kind of, that's uh, led to the deck that we shared with you. So we want, we know that we need to create awareness on LinkedIn and we want to capture demands through intent data and webinars, right? But why? And why sales even should buy in? Here's what you need to work on. Interview them on their go-to-market problem, uh, on their go-to-market challenges, right? Or problems that they are currently facing. When you start talking to them, they could mention a lot of things, right? They could mention that we are kind of a don't our sales or me as a sales rep, I'm not getting even replies, right? I feel it's because of lack of brand awareness, and I also see that our prospects they are signing up for the webinars that our competitors are hosting so that could be a nice touch point right our competitors also like post product videos which are pretty nice and i feel if i can do something like this that could be helpful just giving you a like an overview of how that conversation might go right and uh obviously if you'll end up with only this interview you still won't get buy-in from executives. You need to connect these challenges to the revenue problems because here is the thing. If you are hitting the revenue targets with what you are currently doing, you won't be able to change the things. It's, it's really simple. Why change if everything works, right? But if things are not working, you need to prevent the conversation, which would be all about finger pointing and blaming each other for the missed revenue targets, right? It's like we were kidding in London, the leads are weak, no, you are weak, right? So just to avoid that, that conversation between marketing and sales. Uh, you need to have this conversation and then tie these, uh, let's say, challenges to the uh, revenue problems. For example, you can say, Samsung, we used to grow double digits every year, but the growth slowed down in 2023. And also in 2024, we expected sales to generate 70% of the revenue, like let's say 20 million for 2024, but it's currently at 40%, right? So that's, and this, this is the first red flag. 
that your executives will definitely pay attention to, also sales leaders as well. Marketing generates close to 50% of the total revenue through organic and demand capturing, but it's not sufficient anymore to keep the desired growth rate. If not fixing the current way of generating revenue through sales, the company is likely to miss revenue targets by 10 million, right? Then sales try to, to run key account programs without tight collaboration with marketing. They suffer from low response rates. We need to increase awareness and response rates by creating and sharing target content. And then you start talking about the recommended approach, uh, what you want to do, why you think it will work, some outcomes, right? Required investments, these key milestones, resource allocation. And you can share just this simple document uh, or you can create the deck that we share it with you it depends on you know much better right how your stakeholders prefer to consume that content so you define what would be the best format but that's the key so you always start with defining sales challenges and then tie these challenges to the revenue targets right this is something uh like stakeholders, they don't buy in the idea that we don't have enough brand awareness. They might say, this is why marketing exists. So go and figure it out, right? But when you clearly show that what we are currently doing is leading us to missed revenue targets, that's the red flag. And then you say, we have a plan. We want to give it a try, right? That's the key, how you can get the buy-in from everybody. And this is as well how you can also to tackle this global challenge. So if you're let's say headquarter sends one vision, you can say, hey guys, we kind of understand your vision, but here is the reality. Here are our challenges. And if I want to incorporate what you are saying, it's likely will lead us to missed revenue targets. Instead, we have this suggestion, right? This suggestion is based by data. We know why we want to do this and we know that it will help us to fix our, our current challenges, right? There is uh, like, Every region could have different go-to-market circumstances, different go-to-market environments. Somewhere you have better brand presence, somewhere you have weaker competition, right? So it just depends. You need, and some somewhere you have new team. Um, maybe the market maturity is lower. So you always need to adjust this to, to to your reality, and that would be the best way how you can present it at the headquarter. So hope that was helpful and valuable. Let us know in the chat if uh, the episode was helpful and valuable. Curious to hear your feedback, guys. And uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to post them in the chat so we can, we can target them. And uh, just to remind, next week we are going, while you are typing, next week we are going to host this pilot ABM webinar. So I will drop link one more time so you can just sign up. All right, so we'd really love to hear your feedback. There was a question I started to answer in the chat from Melanie. Uh, she was basically asking who in the company needs to create the program according to you. We are a small marketing team existing on head of marketing and all bound between marketing and a content writer. Should it be the head of marketing together with head of sales, head of, head of marketing alone and get feedback after? So we had a back and forth. Basically, I wanted to also share an example. I mean, ideally, in ideal world, this will be a joint effort between the head of marketing and head of sales who are going to create um, a, a proposal for the budget and defend it uh, with executives and the CFO in your case, right? But of course, it, 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 it always kind of different, a different team. So very frequently what I see is that the head of sales will one way or another have to go with the plan because they will have targets for the next year and they will need to create, create a plan and a budget to how, what do they intend to do to hit those targets, right? And so an example that, that this made me think of was a medium-sized team um, I think maybe the total, total company was about 300 people, but I think like the marketing team was three, four, five people. And then uh, sales team was a bit larger as always, right? Uh, where actually the head of marketing, the CMO would normally present a separate plan and the sales would present a separate plan, but she had an ambition. The, 
CMO had an ambition to make more impact with her marketing, to create more uh, marketing source revenue, and to also have more impact on sales. And so what she did, like she was the one who is initiating that is one of what, the reason why I asked her, like is a follow-up question, like who is the one who is initiating, who has the ambition as well? Like, so in this case, she had an ambition uh, for herself personally and for her team to make a bigger impact within the organization, right? And then she actually worked together uh, with our help. She worked out a plan where we first agreed, so we, we created a plan. Uh, we spoke to the sales, uh, head of sales. We spoke to the marketing people. We created a plan and they took uh, bits and pieces of our presentation and they joined it together with sales and they presented it to their leadership team. So that was an ideal scenario where still like there was one person who in, uh, who was initiating this better collaboration between sales and marketing. That was her goal. She wanted to have bigger impact, better co collaboration. Uh, they created a plan. They created um, the, 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 the joint, let's say, if we, if, uh, there's nothing changed and this is just what we will do with sales this is the impact that we expect if we do this thing together with marketing as the cmo is uh, suggesting then we expect to have a bigger impact a better 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 results and she eventually got it approved i'm not sure melanie if this answers your question uh, but without that collaboration uh, it will be very difficult for that had a marketing you know, or whomever to get that uh, approved. Awesome. Okay. And I feel, yeah, we have covered pretty much yeah. everything that we wanted for today's episode. Thanks a lot for the fantastic questions, guys. And as I mentioned, in one week, to, we are going to uh, host the webinar How to Plan Your ABM Program for 2025. And then in Two weeks we are going to host this episode about the events like you asked us so stay tuned we are wishing you the great rest of the week and talk to you next week cheers everybody cheers bye bye